I think I can't say AI without someone cringing. Uh, but like no, I first. spent the last long time, <laughs> I spent the last long time like working on SaaS and how SaaS companies grow. And so the thing that keeps me sort of up at night, but also get excited is like, does any of that resonate with AI companies? Is it going to look mm. the same? How different is it going to be? What's relevant for these kinds of businesses? And what are the like innovators doing in this space that we should all be learning, learning from? Uh, I don't want to be the dinosaur that like knew how to sell on-premise software through steak dinners and missed the wave of like SaaS and cloud and then PLG, right? <laughs> Today's successful revenue leaders once started their careers just like you and I. They faced the challenges that their careers brought to them, they rose to the occasion, and became the leaders that we admire today. Join me as we explore the skills and stories that make a great leader with a pinch of vulnerability. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Sales Therapy. I'm your host, Alper Yurder. Grab a chair. This is your exclusive invitation to the therapy room as leaders are going to be sharing their career-defining moments, their secret tips and tricks in their arsenal towards success. And I promise we'll always end on a positive note. So today in the therapy chair, we have Carl Poyer, who needs no introduction. This probably this introduction is going to take forever because he is the creator of Growth Unhinged, probably one of the very few news newsletters I still keep an eye on in my 50,000 plus um, unread email inbox. Kyle is an ex-consultant like myself. He's currently a partner at OpenView. He is a true influencer and trendsetter for me that I follow on everything from founder stories to revenue, growth, um, client success. He always writes data-driven, full of amazing example uh, content, and he always speaks to the best people to speak to. So I'm really looking forward to this chat. We'll talk about his success, the joy, the pain, and the journey. So after that very long intro, welcome to Sales Therapy. Kyle, how are you feeling today? Yeah, thanks for having me on. But I'm feeling a little triggered by 50,000 unread emails. Is that true? Do you yeah, have that many? And I post about it too. Honestly, since I've become a buyer the last four or five years, I get bombarded like anybody else. At some point, I gave up. I mean, obviously, I had this old... Oh, nice. Good. This is my therapy now. I have the old CD and I was cleaning, <laughs> but I gave up, man. I don't, don't you give up? What do you do? I'm at inbox zero. So oh, I'm my God. Kind of, I'm, still, I'm still an OCD person. <laughs> I am holding myself so much not to swear because I'm so jealous of that, but I won't. Okay. Good for you. I hit I'm... unsubscribe a lot. I can tell you that. <laughs> uh, yes. Yes. Teach, teach me, master. I can tell you the one thing I haven't unsubscribed from yet, um, and I probably will never, is, is you. And there's so much people can learn from you. Whatever. We'll talk. So I made a that very, very kind of you. Uh, you're making me uncomfortable. The Bostonian in me is getting more and more uncomfortable the more you yeah, call me an okay. influencer. I'll, so okay, fine. All right. I'll, 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 I'll shut up making you feel cringe about it. Um, yeah, if you have 48K uh, followers and you're writing good stuff in the middle of a lot of shit, then I think you deserve it. Anyway, whatever. Let's go into therapy. So any good therapy starts with childhood and growing up. Uh, I love understanding the relationship between your growing up experience and the person you've become today, your values, who you are at business. So can we hear a little bit about your life before work? Yeah, happy to jump into it. So I come from a family of small business owners and entrepreneurs. Uh, it's actually my grandfather fought in World War II. He came back and on the ship back, he gambled all of his earnings from the war and actually like 10x what he made and used that to open a, initially a tire business and then a used car business. Uh, he had 10 kids, including my dad, obviously, and all 10 kids worked, worked at the business. Uh, and then my dad actually started his own car dealership business. Uh, and then I worked there in high school. And so that um, kind of part of, you know, being part of a small business and seeing the ups and downs uh, and also that sort of angle of like, my dad didn't have a boss, you know, he didn't want to have his own boss, right? Uh, he wanted, or he wanted to be his own boss. That was instilled in me pretty early on of like going and building what you want to exist in the world and creating your own future. Uh, and then... Yeah, you know, other things. I come from Ohio. We moved there when I was 15. That was a difficult transition coming from California to Ohio uh, and uh, trying to navigate uh, <laughs> that new school, new environment, different cultural experience from, from what I was used to, especially being someone who's 
LGBT uh, moving at the age of 15 to a really socially conservative place is not something I'd recommend uh, to anyone listening here. And then other things from childhood, I mean, I, uh, I've i always, always someone that was like, loved to explore different topic areas. And so I uh, went to college at Brown where there's famously like no required curriculum. You can kind of study what you want. And I remember my parents were so concerned. Uh, they were <laughs> like, we've heard of people studying like New England cemetery design and you could you could major in that at Brown like are you sure this is what you want to do it's like that sounds amazing (laughs) and I did actually take a course on that uh, where I had to literally walk through a number of cemeteries uh, and got locked in one at one point but I just love that exploring different topics and was very much like a liberal arts student at heart. It sounds like in life you've been able to do things that you wanted to. Have you ever felt like you're forced to do something work-wise or or education-wise just because you were told or you had to or you had to achieve some goals or it's kind of being like, yeah, I like this, so I'll do this. I've been, uh, yeah, (laughs) whether you could call it like, uh, I've never had a master plan, I'll say that, and I also tried to, craft my own path. There were a lot of changes though. Like when I was in college, I studied uh, environmental studies, right? Not business oriented at all. And my internships, I actually had one in in chemistry uh, at a paint company. I had one in environmental studies working for municipal government in the city of Cleveland. And then one in climate adaptation working for a federal agency in NOAA. And then I pivoted and went into business consulting and then now VC, which is very different from the environment. And I think the only kind of trigger on that that actually was externally forced was I graduated in the recession, a lot of Mm. kind of energy and investment around climate change and climate adaptation really uh, went down after like a a kind of big US climate bill failed uh, to get to, uh, to pass. Uh, and be become legislation. And so I, I kind of pivoted my focus from climate and, uh, and the environment, which is still a passion area of mine personally, but pivoted into business. And that was um, very, very challenging to both even navigate, like what does a business career mean? And how do you break in? And like, what is going to be interesting to me that I'm going to want to do? And so it was still very much like a kind of personal decision to go to go down that path, but uh, motivated partly by external circumstances and having a bunch of student loans uh, and graduating <laughs> okay. in a session, which sort of forces your hand to go find something that, that has a lucrative career opportunity. Yeah, that's kind of what I wanted to get to because in my life, so you've been a consultant at what was it, Simon Kushner? What, what, which? Yeah, Simon Kutcher. I uh, uh, that was my first job out of college. Okay, okay. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Star- I graduated in May and started in June of that yeah. same year. Um, I did my share of Bain Accentural, that consulting life, and even though I was like dying to do six due diligences in a row until 2 a.m. and no sleep and blah, blah, and now looking back, it was not particularly what I wanted to do in life. Hence my question, like sometimes life mm. forces us to do things because you have a career in mind you want to build and you feel like that's the thing to do. Also, your peers are doing it. But you you sounded like in your intro, you just went with your heart. You weren't really forced to do something just, just to fit in. Anyway. Yeah, it's. I mean, for me, I, I didn't go in as a stepping stone job, even mm. though... It, it kind of is that way for a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, if I probably were going in for a stepping stone job, I wouldn't have picked such a niche, <laughs> hyper specialized <laughs> firm. Uh, but at, uh, at Simon Kutcher, the pitch really spoke to me and just the opportunity to solve a bunch of interesting problems, work with a ton of, uh, you know, wide variety of, of clients and work on revenue growth, which like that's all the firm touches versus like cost cutting, diligence work, things like that. Yeah. Uh, and honestly, like the, it seems like such a crazy jump to go from the environment to, uh, to business and consulting. But a lot of what I was doing from a climate change standpoint was helping work with businesses or other organizations to identify like what was their carbon footprint and where were their opportunities to reduce their carbon footprint in a way that would actually uh, save them money or help them meet their goals as a business, not just do it from an environmental standpoint. Mm. And so it's actually already working with organizations on different topics as kind of like in an advisory or consulting type of capacity. And so this was just like adding to that toolkit around gotcha. being able to have other topics to be able to work with companies gotcha. around. And, uh, 
I found a lot of passion in that, although there were certainly ups and downs. I mean, I remember one of my clients, I uh, went to pitch uh, the kind of final presentation and the CEO and founder was in the room. This is like a unicorn SaaS company. And he walks in and he sees me standing there ready to present. And he goes, wait, you, you led this? You're leading this? It's like, yep. Like, mm -hmm. they're paying us and I've been the one who's leading it. And then he's like, I thought you were the new BDR that we just hired. Ooh. Like, all right. This is the, the challenge of, you know, consulting is it's like yeah. the flip side. You get a ton of career opportunities. You get put in rooms that you yeah. don't necessarily have any right to be in, yeah. but you kind of work hard and you figure it out. Mm. Uh, but uh, it's it could be stressful. That's for sure. Yeah, I love it. I hear a lot of actually now the patterns about. So when I read about things that you write, it's always so inspiring, so rich and fulfilling filled with data that's not difficult to read. Okay, now I'm going to give you the cringe again, but I don't care. But now I see the pattern, the, the research, the intellectual curiosity, which leads you to do what you're doing, I think. Okay, before we move on with the success, one thing you mentioned is the car dealership experience, which I'm still, in my mind, is still turning. So you, were you a stereotypical car dealer salesman? What, what were you? How was that experience for you? <laughs> well, this was in high school. So I was not in a position to sell anything. I would have been really, really bad at selling anything. So I was mostly responsible for odd jobs, uh, cleaning and detailing cars, right, oh, okay, going and fine. running titles, things like that. I do remember I, I uh, had just gotten my license, right? I was like 16 years old. And I remember uh, driving a car to go change the title uh right and the uh i got a blowout on the freeway but i had no idea what a blowout was i didn't know the term for it <laughs> and i remember like pulling over on the side of the highway calling my dad and saying the tire came off the car he's like <laughs> what he's like, the tire is off the car that sounds I was like something not i would say to, that sounds i was like not meant to work in the automotive industry by any means but it was a good experience yeah, so good I, to have have that experience rather it wasn't good while i was doing it I, I, I spoke over you there but it sounded like something i would say as a non-native english speaker um, but i'm glad you know the term now good good for you <laughs> <laughs> i mean i'd much rather have a different kind of blah well, like from a hair standpoint you know going to uh having that kind of experience would be better than you know tire blow on the freeway yeah Okay, so moving moving to your years after your first first career experience in, in that consultant, like proper consultant experience, I like to talk a little bit about, so we know you as the Kyle Poyer that we see you on, on um, you know, multiple platforms, et cetera, et cetera. I'm sure a lot of people look up to you and like, oh yeah, this guy is really successful. Can you share a little bit the journey getting to that point and some career defining moments for you, maybe some highs and lows where you felt like this is not for me or where you felt like this is it for me. Did you have any of those? Certainly, I don't know every, everyone goes through those kinds of experiences uh, in life. I mean, for me, uh, if I look back to consulting days, so I spent six years in consulting, generally had a very favorable time there, uh, but it's also an environment where there's a ton of turnover, right? A lot of people are in that role for 18, 24, Four months. So I made some amazing friendships there. And then a lot of why you're willing to put in the hours and the travel is because you're like 24 and all your friends are working there and doing the yeah. same thing. Yeah. And so going through the sort of loss and like losing touch with people, going from like seeing them every day and working around the clock with them to like having them move and not keeping in touch was certainly painful. Um, and then as I kind of stayed on and more and more of the people I had started with left, I had started to, you know, essentially so much responsibilities that I got to the point of like not being able to keep up with it at all, which I think mm -hmm. happens to a lot of people in their careers is that you reach this sort of breaking point where you feel like you're saying yes to every responsibility and not don't know necessarily how to say no, or if you can say no to something, so just take it on and figure it out. And then all of a sudden there's a breaking point because it's, it's not sustainable. And so I remember getting to that point where I was traveling every week, Monday through Thursday. I got to a point where I was traveling like 14 straight days. I had to like make a last minute trip and spend two weekends in a row in the, in the city where my client was. And I uh, was so burnt out afterwards. I remember I got a massage at the, at the hotel after the final presentation. It was the most painful massage yeah. I've ever experienced. And I was like, can you, can you reduce the pressure? She's like, this is the lowest pressure. <laughs> 
Uh, it was like not meant to be uh, a painful massage at all, but that was how much sort of stress and anxiety I had uh, from that experience. So that really taught me both like how to have more t tools to and confidence to advocate for myself uh, earlier on, so so things don't get unsustainable. Also taught me a lot of like the the importance of having a great team that you're working with that you can delegate things to and trust that they're going to to get it done versus uh, I was very much a micromanager, you know, yeah. up to that point. I still have some challenges with, with yeah. micromanaging. All, all been there, done that, uh, sure. And then also just making sure I was, you know, there's some things that are... Uh, that that experience led me to really reflect on like if consulting was the path that I wanted to do for yeah. forever because yeah. I had been doing it for you know five six years was growing in the role was sort of moving to that partner track which was going to be essentially like a career level commitment and also led me to sort of say I had a great run but what else is out there right like I haven't I'm too I'm too young to like give my entire life to this one thing, especially okay. if, if uh, there can be so much pain involved. And you so found that, the, those were, those were certainly some moments. And you found the solution in something even more challenging, the world of VC, is, is that the answer? Uh, I don't know if it's more challenging than consulting. I okay. mean, with VC, so the, the role that I moved into, uh, I actually took a step down both in like pay and responsibility um, initially, And the idea for me was get a, like a broader range of experience and also focus more on startups. Like in consulting, you go to clients that will like yeah, pay you more. Of course. And so it's generally a step more established companies, either publicly traded companies or companies that have a ton of funding. And I worked with a few startups in my time, but like I wanted to get more access to startups and work on a more wide variety of problems with them. Yeah. And so really got super fortunate to have that kind of role in Boston, uh, where I was living. But in, you know, for startups, a lot of times, like the experiences, um, they have like, they're very open to feedback and trying new things. They recognize they don't have it all figured out at an early stage in a company's growth. They don't have like executive leaders who've been there, done that and a lot of functions. And so even having like some experience in a topic is often really useful for someone that's like trying trying something for the first time. Yeah, of course. And so I found that it, it wasn't like this is more intellectually challenging because uh, it's always like the problems were simpler. The challenges were more of like the uh, context switching across a lot of companies and a lot of different topics, figuring out how to prioritize my time And then also like influence. So like in, in a consulting world, you sell the project and then, you know, you're on hook to deliver a recommendation. They follow through with it. Like that's on them. Like that's their decision. You have to just deliver on the service that someone paid, you know, a million dollars for whatever it is. Yeah. In a VC platform role, it's an opt-in service that companies have access to, but like you're not a majority investor. And so the company also has control for what they do. And so if you think, if you have an idea for them to explore, you have to either be influential with how they, uh, how you communicate it or get them sort of eager to try it out and trust you or There's actually the alternative path where like, because you're from a VC, there's sort of an innate, like the VC is influencing me. They're telling me what to do. And so in some cases you actually have to be really mindful about not influencing someone from an independent decision, especially if it's not something that you have a ton of conviction around. And so that like communication and influence and what was the right level of influence for the different situation was very hard to, to navigate in that role. I mean, a lot of that resonates. And I remember when at the end of my career at Accenture, I was dying to go into startup world because I wanted to make that switch from enterprise established to like new and like fresh problems and building something. I think a lot of younger people have that drive, like tangible. I want to be part of that story. How many founders, if you were to do the math very quickly, like, Ballpark. How many founders do you feel like you've interacted with in your time? In well, it's definitely hundreds. Uh, the portfolio has about 30 active co portfolio companies, but there's new ones every year, right? Um, and exits every year. But then just given the work that I do with the community, I meet a lot of companies yeah. um, and I try to be open to having a number of conversations with founders, at least a few every single week that are not portfolio companies. And so I also, I always learn a ton from those conversations and, and find them to be just uh, like mutually beneficial. Uh, like exposes me to more challenges and, and more uh, diverse experiences. But yeah, it's been, there's been a lot of founders who I've met 
over the years. Yeah. Are there any common themes that like come to your mind generally when people want to talk to you? These are the few things they want to talk about. The themes have changed over the years. Uh, yeah. I mean, in the startup world, like for especially early stage companies, the themes can be kind of consistent, right? It's like, how do I figure out my ideal customer profile, especially if we don't have that many customers or like any customers yet? How do I figure out how to monetize my product and like, can I test monetization? How do you do that, right? Should I go PLG from the beginning? Should I go sales oriented? What should be the profile of my first salesperson? What about my first marketing hire, right? A lot of it's around like company building and setting up like the V1 go to market for a new product. Uh, but then over time, you know, especially um, as, as sort of the markets changed and as founders have gotten more uh, sophisticated and like the rise of AI, the questions are a little different now. Like there's a lot more baseline knowledge around like the conventional ways to build a software company. Mm -hmm. And so now the questions are more of like, how does AI change my go-to-market strategy and, and where can we leverage AI to be much more efficient? Or how do I pair PLG and sales in the right way without like overburdening my team? because it's a lot to manage doing both at the same time. How can I think about like usage-based or more creative pricing models that are like disruptive in my space, but that are really unproven as well? The questions are sort like more fun these days yeah. than they were six, seven years ago. I love that. And we'll dive into the questions in, in a minute. I'm just curious, like, do you have your process for you figured, bringing it a little bit back to today and how you juggle different things? You have the community, you have the newsletter, you talk to people, you have your day job, etc. Do you have a process to keep it all kind of like a virtual cycle? You know, you have a conversation with somebody, it sparks something else. Like, how does that work for you? How do you juggle all those different things? Yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's an evolution over time. Uh, and for me, a lot of the beginning of like my, my sort of content and like influencing, if you will, uh, let's find you a better with, word, like, creator. A... Let's call you a creator, know, so hate, you'll feel hate... you'll feel better. <laughs> I hate the word influencing and have a conversation with a founder or get asked a question over email, write like a really detailed response to a set of ideas or you know bring bring data to that question. Then it would sort of die, and then I like. A few months later, I'd have the same question, be like searching through my email. Hey, how did I respond to this before maybe <laughs> edit it? And I realized I could take a lot of what I was writing and like, you know, obviously anonymize it, open source the knowledge, put it out there and then learn in that process, right? Because as soon as you put that out there publicly, people start commenting on it, either agreeing with it or disagreeing with it, giving you other examples, or just you kind of figure out who the people are that are interested in these topics. And then you start to meet those people and have conversations with them to really explore this. So I found I was giving better advice when I open sourced that and got more feedback yeah. and yeah. built more of a community. I just like also got to know people that were true experts in different, like sp very specific topic areas. And so that was sort of like the uh, seed uh, posting on LinkedIn. I started doing it much more actively around COVID times in 2020 and just found it was a really great outlet when I had extra time, like not commuting and being at home. It was a great way to meet people when I like wasn't going to events or meeting people face to face. And then so much sort of goodness came out of it. I mean, I'd even have like portfolio companies that saw something and then they wanted to talk about it, right? Because they were thinking about that too. They just didn't even realize they should have reached out to me for help or, or to discuss it. But because they saw it publicly, they were like, hey, this is a bigger topic to explore further. So it started to become that virtuous cycle there. And then uh, I was realizing like I was too beholden to LinkedIn and like mm -hmm. the whims of the algorithm. Mm -hmm. And so much of things would like go away, like they would have traction in the first 24 hours. And then once it's out of someone's feed, they like basically can never find it again. Um, and I felt like I should take some of these ideas, especially the ones that really resonated and build them out, take the knowledge, take the, the comments and so on and like craft a more thoughtful piece. And so I started to basically cr write this newsletter about, you know, I think it was March 2021 that I started it. Been almost three years. And the initial pieces were all essentially like deeper dives on LinkedIn posts that I had had. And then the nice thing is like you share those back on LinkedIn, it kind of re-engage the, the conversation, get and then it kind of all um kind of promotes itself, but also kind of becomes bigger 
as you keep doing it. That also that audience allowed me to meet a ton of really interesting people with thoughtful ideas and then, you know, feature their ideas on the newsletter. And so more and more of the newsletter is now not just my miscellaneous thoughts on yeah. growth, but sort of like the community where there's readers of the newsletter who are contributing the bylines or who I've interviewed for pieces. And we're kind of all getting smarter together. And then, yeah. you know, the hope for me is that that makes me much more useful for any portfolio companies. I just love that you say we're all getting smarter together because sometimes amidst the LinkedIn noise, I feel like I'm getting dumber. So I'm making sure that I follow <laughs> the right people. So I keep being smart and despite the algorithm and whatever, where did that name Growth Unhitched come from? Oh, uh, I brainstormed like a bunch of names uh, and I was- And you didn't have really... ChatGPT then, so you had to come up I with- I did not have ChatGPT. <laughs> I brainstormed a bunch of names. The key things for me was like, I wanted it to have growth because that was like the core to what of I was course. doing yeah. and like what was going to be the focus. And then I wanted something else with that, uh, but I just didn't want it to sound like something else that was out there. I didn't want to copy someone else's name. And I also just wanted it to feel a little different, like not the advice that you hear from everyone. Like at the time, PLG was relatively new and I wanted to talk about PLG and not just like traditional SaaS growth, which was very sales heavy at the time. Yep. I wanted to talk about pricing. I wanted to talk about what's new and what's next. And so I liked this idea of like unhinged because unhinged both means like, instead of constraining your growth, you're gonna like unhinge that growth and it can kind of take off. Uh, but it's also unhinged and that like, it's out of the box. It's a little weird. It's different. It's has a personality to it. Yep. Uh, it's, it's unexpected. And so I like the name and I've, I've stuck with it for almost three years now. So it seems yeah. to be resonating. It's it certainly is. You inspire a lot of people, obviously, with what you do. And I know like your community, etc. Maybe you're like an Oscar speech. Your father, mother <laughs> inspires you. But are there any particular people you would love to name or books or anything that inspires you to do something better? Like, for example, I have a couple of them. One of them is you and, you know, others that I see like authors, etc that inspire me to do better, you know, that inspire me not to give in to the, uh, the just the right guys, what's happening, but keep on track, like be smart, write the right thing, etc. That was a long tailed question, but do you have some of those? Yeah, well, my, so my initial inspirations were always like the people that were doing this kind of work outside of tech. Yeah, you probably can't tell. I'm a junkie when it comes to like history, the environment, politics, like a bunch of other topics that are non-tech related. My friends generally don't work in tech and are like, what the heck do you do? Uh, and so people like, you know, Ezra Klein, or uh, if you look at like, there's so many creators kind of in the, uh, in, in both like politics and, and history that have a mix of like data-driven content, research, deep dives, like podcasts. And I was always drawn to that over more traditional news. And so uh, those kinds of folks were always uh, the ones that I've kind of gravitated to, uh, like the Nate Silvers of the world. And then in the tech world, uh, Lenny is a huge inspiration. I mean, you can't be a creator yeah, and not fan, fanboy, uh, Lenny Richitsky. <laughs> uh, he had one of the first like quality Substack newsletters that I ever read and subscribed to. And it was like such a different way of doing content. And I was like drawn to it, to that. He also, you could tell the, the thought and the time that he puts into every piece in terms of editing and like original research that goes into it and then really amazing visuals. 100%. Uh, yeah. So he's been an inspiration and like r being able to do two bylines with him in 2023 was like a huge highlight for me personally of like being featured on my Like Heroes <laughs> newsletter. Uh, and then otherwise, uh, in, in terms of like the people that do kind of what I do, Elena Verna I, is just like incredible. And for me, it's the authenticity she brings around like her personality shows through her originality, her voice. She's not afraid to say things that might be controversial yeah. or that not everyone agrees with her. Uh, and she's just so out of the box with her gifts and memes and everything. So uh, <laughs> I've been hesitant to be as authentic and as personal in that way. And a lot of a lot of my content and so on, like I, my goal for myself for the next year is to like infuse more of that personality into, into what I do. Yeah, I think that can only do you good, Kyle. All right. So this next section is generally where I put you in the therapist chair, uh, meaning 
we, I want to discuss some of the things like problems, issues that you see with the founder community. What are you solving for some juicy topics, and which are very practical. I'm sure you have a lot of practical advice on those. But just before I go into that, a very quick question, if I may, which generally I do with my guests today, I won't do in detail with you. Uh, but generally I go, what brought you to the therapy chair today? Which is basically what problem are you trying to solve for your own business, for yourself, other than, you know, the help that you give to people? Are you trying to figure out something yourself at the moment? A problem you're seeking a solution to? What keeps you awake at night? Do you have any of those? There's a few. Uh, <laughs> always have a few. One is like... I think I can't say AI without someone cringing, uh, but like Me I first. spent the last long time, <laughs> I spent the last long time like working on SaaS and how SaaS companies grow. And so the thing that keeps me sort of up at night, but also get excited is like, does any of that resonate with AI companies? Is it going to look mm. the same? How different is it going to be? What's relevant for these kinds of businesses? And what are the like innovators doing in this space that we should all be learning from? learning from. Uh, I don't want to be the dinosaur that like knew how to sell on-premise software through steak dinners and missed the wave of like SaaS and cloud and then PLG, <laughs> right? Very sort of cognizant about, about that. And, and so that's an area of a lot of interest for me. But the other thing that I, I think about a lot is um, it feels really hard to sell and stand out in this environment. Uh, for everyone. Yeah. And some yeah. of it is the economy, uh, for sure. But a lot of it's just like, there are so many SaaS companies, especially SaaS companies that sell to other SaaS companies. Uh, there's also, in some ways, like never been an easier time to build a startup. If you look at the talent that's available, the tools to, to get something off the ground, uh, there's a lot of competition in many, many, many markets. And so how do you break through that noise um, and build something uh, that it like can grow and grow in a sustainable and efficient way with like fewer resources than you might have had a year or two ago. Uh, that's just really, really hard to do. And so I'm always wowed by the folks that, that do it. But I'm also thinking about like, what is that playbook in this economic environment? Oh, which I just feel like I need another <laughs> in three months, another episode with you because that topic alone is A, I try to solve for that for others. B, I try to solve for that for myself. Um, it resonates in so many ways. Actually, it's much more exciting for me to stand out from the crowd instead of talking AI. But I'm going to throw a few topics at you. Let's dive into one because we're coming into the end of our very lovely conversation. But I have to be a good therapist and cut us on time. So I'm going to throw a bunch. Let's pick one and dive a little deeper. Is that okay? Okay. Sounds so, good. So you always talk about growth experiments in your newsletter. So, you know, what are people trying to do to figure out how to grow? Maybe we can talk about some trends for 24 that you're observing. Another one, we already mentioned this, what stands out or not. That's that's always, I think it can be a podcast on its own. Another one, which is really interesting for a lot of my listeners, uh, from the journey from zero to one. And, and I know you mentioned AI as well. So how do you monetize AI? How do you explore the unexpected? I guess there are four of them. So let's pick one and go. Yeah, well, maybe, maybe like trends around go to market and company building is a good one to start with. Let's uh, do that. A, a few just observations from from my my standpoint uh there is a shift that i i can feel in the market it's hard to quantify but like a shift away from like corporate brands and corporate marketing marketing to creator and sort of more personal led brands where um, they're powered a lot by the community and the community is often very influential in like creating the brand and evangelizing the brand and so tapping into like personal brands, um, leaning on influencers in an in a, a authentic way, maybe like even enabling employees and leaders to become influential within a space. And then like just build powering a community around the product that like facilitates growth. Uh, that's just been, it's been a trend for a while. And, and I think that there is an emerging playbook around like at least kind of ways to, to kickstart that. Uh, but I find that to be an amazing area right now. I mean, it's obviously really hard to prove attribution from. It doesn't generate revenue like right away as soon as you uh, do it, like, you know, running a paid campaign might, uh, but it can lead to really, really powerful modern brands and like strong advocates uh, that yep. will go to bat for, for, for great products. It's, 
It's like the air, we all feel it, it's there, and that's kind of the playbook for the modern founder, like from zero to one, I think it's a no-brainer, which including, you know, yours truly <laughs> trying to do and, and learn from in that sense. So if I may totally. just in, inter, interject on that, like, do you have a few examples, a few people, brands, whatever, uh, even the ones that you speak to more recently who do a good job of that? people can get inspired from or can copy, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, Enzo from June.so does a great job of that. Uh, he he does a lot of content around kind of the journey to like building products, pre-product market fit um, mm -hmm. and sh building in public with his own company. And so, and his visuals are amazing. So it's uh, both like authentic to him, value add to his audience and very relevant to like using his product. I think Adam Schoenfeld from Keyplay slash Peer Signal has also mm -hmm. done a ton of interesting things. I mean, it's mm -hmm. a it's a data play around go-to-market data and to have kind of a media lab that's looking at that data and writing about trends and um, kind of key learnings that are that are emerging from this data set and like doing so from like his personal vantage point uh, really helps kind of like create the brand to drive awareness and interest in how other companies can leverage that data for their own go-to-market playbooks. Uh, and then otherwise, I think the Pocus team does a great job too. They're in uh, the product-led sales space. Yep, yep. And uh, with Pocus, they have a very strong community around their product. It's called like the product-led sales community. And they've curated it. So it's a really amazing expert group of people. And then they'll have interviews with that community. It's kind of like an AMA session with a, with a given PLS leader. And then they'll turn that into a really great, like very thoughtful content piece, share that in, in public, people learn from it, get inspired by what the best of the best companies are doing. And then, you know, that reaches more people that want to be part of the community, right? And it's kind of evangelizing this concept yeah. of product-led sales more so than it is like selling a product. But their bet is that the more people know what this is and how to do it, the more need there will be for a product like Pocus. Um, they also built this community, I think, before they even had a product. So. Yeah. I think that's kind of a cool play. Uh, but uh, the obvious examples that I follow are like the ones of tech companies that sell to other tech companies. I think it is harder to do this uh, when your target audience is not this like tech sort of um, yep. early adopter audience that like lives on LinkedIn more than <laughs> yeah, they should. <laughs> and, so, uh, and so you do see some companies that are you know doing this pretty well in a vertical SaaS or like other market. Uh, but that playbook does look different from tech companies selling other tech companies. Yeah, absolutely. And as, as the show progresses, I definitely want to have more people from that world because I wasn't always on LinkedIn like this before maybe starting Flola or going into the SaaS world. I mean, I used to be in complex enterprise sales and other verticals. And I figured like, okay, so all the good ideas, they're only from the SaaS world. Is that it? Like, what about all these other industries? Like, where's those people? Where's the sales people <laughs> in those? Where are they speaking? Sometimes it becomes a bit of an echo chamber for sure. Those names that you mentioned, though, I follow and some of them I'm having as guests as well. So I'm really lucky. I'm going to squeeze in one or two rapid fire questions um, just before we close. There's going to be like one minute answers, whatever you want to go with, if you don't mind. So journey. Right, let's do it. Okay, because I want to cover those other things that I said, okay, pick from, and now I'm going to be cheeky. Uh, journey from zero to one. Top three recommendations for anyone trying to go for a journey from um, zero to one million error. Uh, yeah, I think uh, spending more time like validating the product uh, with users before focusing on growth, um, I think is key. And also not rushing to get to that kind of point of being able to launch and grow. Like I think there's some, um, there's like soul searching, there's sort of this like, like creative innovation process. And the more you rush to like, hey, there's a need here, people are using the product, let's go. Yeah. Uh, the more you can lose sight on like building something that's really gonna stand out. I also think like right now, it's especially important to hone an ideal customer profile. So using the early, process uh in like customer discovery interviews before you have a product to and then there's also some like data driven ways you can do this but like figuring out who has the most pain around your product and being able to be really clear of like we are trying to reach this type of person who has this kind of role in this kind of organization they're using this kind of software they're experiencing these pain points today this is where they find products like the more you can build that out you kind of have the plan around how you can go to market before you necessarily even have a product for yeah. that person 
person. And then I think the third is like building a community in those early days around like these early people that you're interviewing, these early beta users, like they're often like very motivated to help you and like can be some of the best advocates for what you're building. And so thinking about that as a community opportunity from the early days, I think makes it so that it's a lot easier to then scale that community later. Uh, because now is when people are like most engaged with helping you out. Yeah, that's definitely all of the above is the strategies that we try to implement. I think they used to call it true fans when I first um, came to the term, like building true fans. And so people who want to see you achieve in life are going to help you to achieve. So definitely leveraging the community. Last question. Are you looking into our space, buyer enablement, digital sales rooms? Is that something that is even remotely interesting to you? If so, what do you think about it? Uh, well, so OpenView is invested in Highspot, which is in the sales enablement space. Uh, and so I do spend a little bit of time there. Uh, in general, like my view is that the way people buy products is changing. I do think more and more people want to have some sort of product experience before they buy. Mm -hmm. uh, that's sort of the rise of PLG. But they don't want to just have a product experience. They also uh, now have like multiple stakeholders involved in a buying decision. They have finance that needs to sign off. There's security reviews. Many PLG products kind of get shut down because security doesn't want them in. Um, I also see a number of AI, a number of companies saying we're not going to adopt any Gen AI in our organization because we're worried about security risks, right? So there's a need to demonstrate that great product experience, but also multi-thread and have enablement across different personas and organization. Uh, and and while you can try to avoid doing that and like try to go for a faster deal with like a more limited persona, often that leads to a deal that's like really small deal size um, or never gets the final approval to close even though the champion loves you or just leads to churn uh, because the customer doesn't have the full support that they need going in. Absolutely. Thank you for all that insight. I, I completely agree. I think a lot of that resonates with me, the complexity, the difficulty. I mean, I've been both on the buyer side and the seller side. On the seller side, I was like, oh my God, closing a deal is terrible. Then I was a buyer and I realized <laughs> buying is even worse. So I thought, okay, let's try to fix these. Um, any questions you have for me before we close? What, what do you see changing the most around go-to-market? I guess this is going to be so cliche, but like... Crap. Very simple, quality over quantity. I mean, that's that's the major thing. I think to the moon and skyrockets and bless people with 1,000 emails and, and, and you'll get something in return is no more. I think quality in everything, the product, the content, people smell BS uh, very easily, especially because now I'm selling to salespeople. You know, all my life I've sold to different, um, you know, industries, etc. But now interacting with salespeople all day, every day for two years. Yeah, they, 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 everybody differentiates between the good and bad easily. So I think just figure out what you're good at and do that the best, you know, don't try to be everything to all. Therefore, you don't need to go for quantity, um, but go for quality. Bit of a cliche answer, but that's my honest answer. It's a good reminder. Absolutely. I think we all need reminders and nudges during the day because we all um, fall back from the good habits if we don't have them. Well, that was a great conversation. Thank you so much, Kyle. Any closing remarks? Uh, well, thanks for having me on. Hopefully people took something away from my uh, my sales therapy session here. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, if you are curious to follow my musings on how to grow a software business, you can find me on LinkedIn or the newsletter Growth Unhinged. And just be mindful that it's a uh, it, it's not meant to be me telling you what to do. It's meant to be a conversation where we're all getting smarter about how to grow, grow a software business. Thank you for, for getting smarter together. Definitely, we need more of that. Now, Kyle, our time is over and I need to cut it on the clock, just like any good therapist. That's a wrap on this episode of Sales Therapy. If you enjoy the show, follow, subscribe on your favorite channels, YouTube, Spotify, we're everywhere. And obviously, I don't need to tell you to follow Kyle or Growth Unhinged because... Yeah, you'll get smarter, basically. So do it for yourself. Thank you for watching this episode. See you. Bye.